Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my presentation will be very short, very basic, very technical. So I would like to give you some, let's say, um, some basic tips and tricks to um, obtain a good uh, specimen for fluorescence microscopy. Because, um, as you have already heard from the previous speakers, it is really difficult to find a good uh, setup of uh, your confocal microscope. It, is, uh, it takes a lot of time uh, to set perfectly uh, the power of the laser, the gain, the offset, uh, uh, to choose the right floor for, and so on. So, uh, please, please, when you decide to go to the confocal microscope, do not waste your time, and please do not waste the time of the poor confocal specialist, okay? Check your sample before going to the confocal microscope, and be sure that your staining is good one, and your sample is a good sample, okay? Check for uh, the eventual autofluorescence, or, and uh, uh, try to ask yourself if there is the possibility to have some uh, artifacts in your sample, okay? So, let's go. Uh, when you go to uh, a microscope, you see something, and you report what you see, okay? But the question is, seeing is believing, so it seems a very trivial question. Uh, I understand that <laughs> this is the point. But uh, remember that uh, mm, an insufficient uh, understanding of uh, your experimental manipulation leads every time to um, <coughs> a, an introduction of errors and artifacts in the final images that you will take uh, uh, using uh, your microscope. So I think it is not so trivial, this, this question. Okay, I uh, will focus only, unfortunately, because I do not have a lot of time, on immunofluorescence and what it is an immunofluorescence experiment. So what it is the immunofluorescence? It is a true, and this is critical, a true, immunological reaction between the primary antibody and the antigen revealed by a fluorescent molecule. So you want to have a true immunological reaction and you want to see it, okay, using a fluorophore. Well, of course, uh, you can use a direct uh, immunofluorescence or very often, this is very common, the indirect one, uh, in which you use your primary antibody against your antigen of choice and then reveal your primary antibodies using a secondary one conjugated with a fluorophore. Okay, this is easy. I know that you already know how to do it. Okay, you have to follow three critical steps to uh, arrive to collect the final data from your sample. You have to take care of the sample preparation, of the image acquisition, and the image processing. These two topics, you will um, heard of these two topics tomorrow morning, I think, and uh, I will concentrate only on the sample preparation. Okay, so the first rule of sample preparation is remember that we, when you have garbage in your sample, you will obtain garbage outside your sample, I mean garbage on your images. And the interpretation of the supposed data it is really, really difficult, okay? So this is the reason why you have to take care of uh, the sample preparation. The second rule, also this one is really underestimated, in my opinion, in my experience, not in my opinion. Uh, okay, very often uh, there is one standardized protocol for immunofluorescence in a certain lab, just one and everyone is using the same immunofluorescence protocol for different tissues, different cells, to look at different antigens in different conditions. And this is totally wrong. What you have to uh, obtain is to set your own immunofluorescence protocol for your experiment. <coughs> and to do this, you, you have to optimize uh, some steps uh, you have to optimize 
the fixation of the sample, the permeabilization, the blocking of the sample, the choice of the fluorophor, and the choice of the mountain. Okay, let's go to the fixation. Um, okay, the most common <coughs> fixation we can use are the cross-linking, uh, the one with the cross-linking fixatives, like aldehydes, or reagents that precipitate proteins like alcohol or acetone. When you use uh, uh, aldehyde fixation, you know, uh, for sure, you create some cross-linking between uh, um, proteins. And to do this, uh, we routinely use paraformaldehyde or glutarachaldehyde. Well, in optical microscopy, in general, we use paraformaldehyde and not uh, glutarachaldehyde, except for very, very special uh, situation. And we will see in a minute why. Let's compare the characteristics of the two uh, aldehydes. So PFA uh, has a um, fast penetration, it is, but it is slower in, in terms of uh, uh, real creation of the cross-linking. Uh, it creates some reversible cross-linking. This is really important. The cross-linking are two-dimensional. There is, unfortunately, a poor morphological preservation, but it is acceptable for optical microscopy. And there is, this is really very important, a low degree of antigen masking. So the aldehyde of choice for optical microscopy is paraformaldehyde because we can break some cross-linking if we need to do it, and because we have a low degree of antigen masking. And of course, we want to recognize our antigen with our precious primary antibody, so this is uh, really an important uh, characteristic of uh, this uh, aldehyde. Okay, so you all know that uh, this is the formula of formaldehyde, but probably not all, all of you uh, know that this is the real active form that you have to use to fix your tissue. So when you prepare a solution of paraformaldehyde, you have the salt of formaldehyde that is composed of uh, a lot of uh, large polymers, and you have to break these polymers to obtain the monomer in a uh, in, uh, in buffer or in water, heating at 60 degrees and increasing a little bit the pH of the solution, around 8, more or less. At this point, uh, you have uh, uh, a lot of uh, molecules of uh, uh, the monomer that are the active form. But what happens when you have this solution of paraformaldehyde? The point is that in solution, unfortunately, the monomer tends to aggregate to recreate some polymer of higher weight, okay? And this happens during time. So the problem is that when you have a lot of polymer of higher molecular weight instead of the monomer, the penetration will be slower, you will have a poor fixation and even a worse background. So you want small polymers and to have small polymers, you have to prepare every time fresh PFA solution, okay? Do not use PFA solution that is ready and it, it stays there for weeks or months. If you need to have something already prepared because you do not have time, you have to prepare it in advance and store it at minus 20, okay? Otherwise, you cannot control the efficacy of the fixation because you do not know which is the balance between the effective molecule, the effective monomer, and the polymers. Okay? It is really critical, believe me. Can I just ask a question? Yeah. Uh, is this the same if it's frozen, the PFA? If you keep it at uh, minus 20, <coughs> uh, this uh, reaction uh, occurs also? At minus 20? Yeah. No, no, you, you can store it in minus 20, okay, then okay. you you thaw and you can use it. Okay. Okay. In, okay. I cannot say if there is a um, very fine difference between the fresh solution and the freezed one. 
uh, if you want to be really sure you are fixing in a better way, prepare it fresh, the, prepare the fresh solution. But of course, it, you, you can use it, the stored solution at minus 20. Uh, I think that um, my suggestion is use the fresh solution if you have to perfuse some animals. Okay, in this case, yes, it is, it is really critical to use the fresh one. Okay, um, so some advantages of uh, formaldehyde fixation. Uh, it is able to cross-link nucleic acids, so you can <coughs> use it for in situ hybridization. Uh, remember that does not cross-link lipids, so you maybe uh, can use some uh, um, small amounts of calcium if you want to, to stabilize your plasma membrane. Um, this is very important, as uh, I said before, the cross-links uh, are cleavable at pH 8.5, so remember that uh, if your primary <coughs> antibody doesn't work, uh, before start crying, try. <laughs> okay, there are there are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, protocols of unmasking. Okay, this is not the only one, but this is really simple. It is a, a, a gentle protocol, so you can you do not risk to uh, destroy your tissue or your cells. And some and very often it works. So you have just to introduce a step. Uh, in, in, uh, in uh, the buffer, in PBS, for example, increasing uh, the pH, and then try again uh, to perform the staining uh, uh, to um, look at your antigen with, uh, with the primary antibody. Okay. And, uh, ah, okay, and this is another, okay, it, it, is, uh, it is funny, but uh, sometimes it happens, so I would like to, <laughs> to give you this advice. Uh, avoid to use uh, um, aldehyde uh, um, uh, aldehyde uh, dissolving it in uh, amine containing buffers such as trees for example because uh, in this case the aldehydes will react with, uh, with the solution okay with the amines present in the solution and not with your tissue okay okay um, I know that you um, work uh, properly and you use uh, a fresh solution of PFA and, and so on for your um, sample, but sometimes could happen that uh, um, you could have the opportunity to receive some uh, piece of tissues, for example, from hospital or from some colleagues, uh, and you have to know how they fix uh, that tissue. And sometimes people uh, use 100% formally. Okay, that it is not the same. It is exactly, it, it is very different than using uh, a fresh PFA solution. Okay, 100% formalin is a saturated <coughs> formalin solution in water on in buffer. The formaldehyde content is uh, uh, around 37-40%. Uh, and warning, because in formalin there is 15% uh, of methanol, it is present as a stabilizer. And methanol has a, mm, another effect on your tissue, okay? It uh, uh, precipitates some proteins and it extracts lipids. So you will have a um, permeabilization of the tissue, okay? So uh, remember that when you receive some tissue fixed, uh, with 100% formalin, uh, <coughs> you could face a different situation comparing with the one that you, uh, with the protocol that you routinely use in, in, in your lab. Okay, so be careful when you have to follow a protocol of fixation. Here I have a funny example. Uh, these are uh, two pictures uh, of uh, uh, cell culture. A student of mine asked me for a new aliquot of DAPI because, as you can see, the DAPI uh, doesn't work. <laughs> and uh, it is clear that uh, in this picture, DAPI is working perfectly, but the nuclei are exploded. So uh, I asked him, but probably there is something wrong in your fixation, maybe, I don't know. Um, and he said, no, 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 I use exactly the same solution, exactly for the same time, this is not the problem. Okay, 
To make a long story short, the problem was that these cells were fixed for five minutes at room temperature, and this for five minutes at four degrees, okay? So, of course, you can fix your sample at four degrees, but take care of the time, because it will take longer time, okay? And five minutes is a very, very, very short time, okay, for fixation with aldehydes. So if you're using a very, very short time, you cannot decrease the temperature, okay? Okay, some uh, disadvantages of the aldehyde fixation, uh, they, uh, they are uh, slower than organic uh, fixative. Uh, sometimes there is a poor penetration of uh, antibodies due to the cross-linking, and sometimes you can face the denaturation of, of the <coughs> antigen. Okay, let's move to the alcohol acetone fixation. Uh, this type of fixation precipitates proteins, so it is good for cytoskeletal proteins. Can denaturate proteins, so never use this type of fixation if you have genetically encoded fluorescent protein in your sample. I mean, EGFP, YFP, M cherry, tomato, etc., etc. Uh, so th this is not trivial because sometimes you have. Uh, you can use, uh, for example, a specific antibody and uh, the protocol uh, that is suggested for that antibody uh, is a protocol uh, that uh, tell you to use this type of fixation. But if in your sample you have some genetically encoded protein, fluorescent protein, you cannot use it. Okay? Um, and then, as I said before, alcohol and acetone extract lipids, so uh, they permeabilize the uh, cells uh, and, uh, and tissue. Okay, disadvantages, uh, small molecules present in your sample will be lost during the subsequent processing step, and also in this case you can have the denaturation of some antigen. Okay, so let's move uh, to the fixative induced fluorescence, so the background fluorescence that you can have in your uh, tissue. This fluorescence is due to a uh, reaction of aldehydes with some tissue components. And look, it is worse with glutaraldehyde, but okay, we will use just paraformaldehyde. But it is worse when fixation is warmer or longer, so it is a good idea to fix your tissue for degrees and to check which is the shorter time able to give you a good fixation. And it is also worse if you use an old solution. <coughs> okay, this is uh, another example. Uh, just to tell you that in mammalian cells and tissue, the, this background fluorescen fluorescence is, uh, mm, <coughs> in general, reduced at longer wavelengths of the visible spectrum. So look at this section. This is a section of a brainstem, and this is just the background fluorescence, okay? There is no staining at all, no fluorophores present in this staining. You can easily imagine that it is, it, it would be really difficult to see a staining <coughs> on this background, okay? But if you use, uh, <laughs> if you use uh, an antibody, a secondary antibody conjugated with uh, a red fluorophore, the, of course it is the same, uh, uh, the same section. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, it is a little bit better. Okay, um, you can see that in this case the cells are clearly distinguishable. So the, the background is not so important as comparing with the green range of the spectrum. So the advice is, if you have to work uh, with aldehydes and uh, you notice that uh, uh, you have a lot of uh, background in terms of fluorescence, remember that the redder, the better, okay? <laughs> so in this case, choose a red fluorophore. Okay. <coughs> Is it dependent on the exposure fine? Is it dependent on? Okay, it's a bush of fine. We can expose the exposure fine to this to be involved in the background. Exposure fine. So if you if you if you use that exposure fine, 
Yes, you, yes, you, of, cor of course you, of course you can play, <coughs> you can play with, uh, with the acquisition, but yes, of course, but uh, um, I think, in my opinion, it is better if you have a so huge amount of background for lessons to use a, a red <coughs> chlorophore to see better your, uh, your uh, because the, the problem is that uh, you, you can try, of course, if you want, you can try to use uh, a green fluorophore. But then you cannot distinguish, uh, for, for example, some region in, in which you can suppose to have very few amount of your antigen, of your antibody, I mean, of your fluorescence, uh, from the, the, the background fluorescence. So, um, in my opinion, it, is, it could be a good idea to move to, to the red fluorophore. As a recommended in the first session, I can uh, it is better to use uh, green mm -hmm. when I use uh, GFB. So, uh, <laughs> for the application purposes. Um, okay, very often when you have GFP um, and, and you have a very high level of, uh, of background fluorescence, you are not able to look uh, in a, in a sensitive way, let's say, or to, or, to, or to acquire a good image from uh, that sample, just to have a nice uh, um, green from your GFP protein, but you have to perform an immunostaining using some antibodies against your GFP protein, just to increase and amplify the signal. Okay. Uh, so there are some uh, uh, structures or, or molecules in your sample that are able to uh, emit uh, fluorescence. This is what uh, Gabriele called uh, natural fluorescence uh, this morning. And for example, you can find some uh, lipofushin granules. These uh, are common in senescent tissue. Uh, it is a... Um, Lipofushin, it is a, a product of uh, lysosomal lipid degradation. Um, you can remove the lipofushin uh, with lipid extraction, for example, using a fixation with alcohol or methanol, uh, with methanol and acetone, or you can quench this uh, fluorescence uh, using uh, a sudan black treat treatment or a capric sulfate treatment. You can search in the net, there are a lot of protocols to perform this type of quenching. Uh, you can find some elastin fibers and you can quench the elastin fluorescence using uh, pontamine sky blue or toluidine blue. You can find some collagen and then you have to take it. You cannot remove the fluorescence from collagen. And you can also find some molecules like tryptophan, NADH or FAD with the peaks in this range of the spectrum and uh, you can see some dots like this <coughs> one in your sample. So in this case, uh, you will have flu fluorescence, but uh, it, uh, it, no, it, it, is not, um, it, it does not come from your um, uh, antigen, uh, but it is due to the presence mm. of these uh, specific molecules. Okay, method to uh, counter autofluorescence. First of all, of course, use fresh PFA um, to have small polymers. You can use glycine. Uh, using glycine, you feed the free um, aldehyde groups present in, uh, in the tissue, uh, or you can reduce the free aldehyde groups using borohydrate or uh, you can use the Sudan black, the toludine blue, or the extraction of, uh, of lipids. Of course, you can play with acquisition, and of, you have to know very well what you are doing. So be careful, because it is really dangerous when you play with acquisition. So in this case, this is a section of um, a vomeronasal organ. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a staining. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a, is a staining against an antigen expressed by the cilia of these cells. So if you know that the, your antigen is working very, in, your um, antibody is working very well, and you know that this type of staining is enough for you, you can play with uh, 
um, the exposure time, for example, to uh, remove the uh, background, the, the black background fluorescence for, from uh, your sample. Okay, uh, so it is really important uh, uh, before starting with an immunofluorescent experiment, check for the autofluorescence in, uh, in your sample. This is another example from uh, one of my students. Uh, this is a section of brainstem, and uh, it was uh, um, stained with an, an antibody against a nuclear antigen. So he asked me for a help to, let's say, quantify <laughs> the fluorescence in the nuclei. So as you can see, uh, this staining is not really nice. So I asked for, uh, first of all, the control of the secondary antibody, that was this one. Okay, and you can see there is not a big difference. And then I would like to see also the control of the tissue simply fixed. And this, this one. <laughs> okay? Uh, it's exactly the same. Okay. Uh, so he had to, uh, of course, work a lot to uh, try to obtain a good result, but this is just a, a, a take on message for you before uh, starting the, uh, or in parallel with your experiment, if you prefer, check for the uh, autofluorescence of, uh, of the tissue or the cell the sample that you are working with. Okay, permeabilization. Uh, this, this is um, a, a step uh, that is uh, every, every time underestimated, in my opinion, but it, it is not a, not a good idea to underestimate this, uh, this step of, uh, of um, the preparation of, of your sample. Um, of course, if you are using alcohol acetone um, fixation, uh, you are already uh, Extra extracting lipids, so um, you do not need another type of permeabilization. But if your sample is fixed uh, with aldehydes, you need a permeabilization to allow uh, antibodies passing through the membranes and reaching uh, the antigen of interest, except when you need to stain something uh, at the out, uh, outside of uh, the plasma membrane. Okay. You can choose between two uh, <coughs> categories of uh, detergent. You have to use some detergents, first of all. And you can choose between two <coughs> categories of detergents. A, a mild one, like digitonin or saponin. Uh, they are um, ionic detergents. Uh, they <coughs> extract uh, selectively cholesterol from the membranes. And they are... Um, very effective if you want to permeabilize only the plasma membrane of the cells. Or you can use some uh, strong detergent like Triton, MP40, Twin20, Icapol. Uh, these are uh, uh, non-ionic detergent. They um, break uh, the protein-protein uh, interaction and protein-lipid interaction without the natural the proteins. Uh, so uh, the effect is uh, more unspecific. Uh, using a proper concentration, you can permeabilize also the uh, internal organelles of, uh, in, in the cell, so the nuclei, the mitochondria, and, and so on. Okay, everything seems very, very easy, very <coughs> simple. Um, you can use the protocol that uh, the postdoc uh, gave you. <laughs> but uh, it, it is, uh, you, can, you can obtain a lot of um, artifact or you can reach some wrong conclusion if, if you do not check also this point, this step uh, of your sample preparation. Remember that uh, the same fixation, and in this case the same permeabilization, May have, uh, may have different, very different, uh, dramatically different effect on uh, different cell types. And I can show you some example. S uh, this example <coughs> are taken from this paper on natural methods, and I suggest you to read it because it is inspiring. Um, and I would like to show just two, two very, very simple examples. 
Okay, in this case, uh, there are some cells, uh, the 293T cells. Uh, they are expressing EGFP, and as you can see, you can distinguish a diffused uh, fluorescence uh, inside uh, uh, the cell uh, body. But if you permeabilize these cells with 0.05% triton, and you use an antibody against GFP, the staining that you obtain is this one. Here you can see the staining in red, okay? It is clear that the, the, uh, fluores the distribution of uh, the fluorescence emitted by the GFP and emitted by the secondary antibody uh, linked to the antibody against the GFP are not superimposable, okay? So, suppose you are working <coughs> with these cells and you are using this protocol. Your conclusions regarding the distribution of the EGFP could be totally wrong. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. And now I have another example mm, similar to this one. Okay, these are the same cells uh, fixed with PFA and methanol and expressing this Claudin-7. Claudin-7 is a, a type junction protein uh, tagged with the EGFP and you can see the fluorescence here. If you use the anti claudin 7 antibody, you can obtain exactly the same pattern of staining. So you have uh, the col a perfect colocalization of the two uh, emission. Okay? So this is a good um, fixation and permeabilization in this case. But if you permeabilize with Triton, you can see the emission of the GFP, but you cannot see the emission of, uh, you, you cannot recognize in this case uh, the um, Claudin-7 using your primary antibody. Also in this case, uh, your conclusion could be totally wrong, okay? So um, pay attention also when you have to choose a protocol of permeabilization and do as much controls as possible. Okay. Uh, at this point, uh, we have to use a blocking solution. Okay. Uh, why do we have to use a blocking solution? For, for some reason. Uh, first of all, because we have uh, unreacted aldehydes in <coughs> our tissue, and these unreacted aldehydes may cross-link antibodies to inappropriate structures. This means that your precious, expensive, wonderful primary antibody could be cross-links by these free aldehydes to something else that has nothing to share with your antigen, okay? And you don't want this situation. It, it is absolutely <laughs> a nightmare. <laughs> okay, so to avoid this situation, you can use uh, just a step in which you feed this free aldehyde with glycine. It is very easy, very, very short, very simple step. You can have in uh, uh, your sample also some structures that could trap antibodies. And in this case, you can uh, mm, saturate the solution using serum albumin, gelatin, or dry milk. You can use one of these, a combination of two of these, a combination of all the three. You have to check, of course. You have to check and you have to see if you have some unspecific uh, uh, presence of uh, uh, antibodies, secondary in this case, we, we hope, or not, okay? You can play with these uh, um, proteins. And then you can have low affinity polyclonal IgGs and they may bind to inappropriate structures. In this case, you can use FBS or if you want to be very elegant, you can use the pre immunoserum from the same species of the secondary antibody. So, goat serum, donkey serum, rabbit serum. But believe me, in 90% of the situation, FBS is enough. In optical microscopy. In electron microscopy, it is another totally different story. Okay.
Okay, and now let's move to the floor for, uh, okay, you know uh, a lot uh, of the floor for because we had the talk of uh, Gabriele uh, a few hours ago, but I would like to uh, um, underline some uh, um, characteristics of the floor for just to give you uh, an idea on uh, what um, you have to take into account to, to choose the right one, okay, for your purpose. Okay, how can we choose the right floor for, for our purpose? Is it simply a matter of color? You can say no, because uh, you know a lot of, uh, you had a lot of information from uh, Gabriele and, and Alessandro. <laughs> But uh, uh, I would like to go through the characteristics of the floor for uh, briefly because you already know this, this uh, um, uh, information. Uh, every floor for has an, a specific excitation emission spectra, a specific quantum yield or quantum efficiency is the same, a specific lifetime, a specific uh, uh, resistance to uh, the photo bleaching. And then I will spend some few words, few words, just few words to, to quenching. Okay, excitation emission spectra, almost the same story, the excitation spectra, the emission one at higher wavelengths, lower uh, energy. This is the identity card of every single floor for, but it is not enough to choose the right one or the, or the best one, okay? Okay. Um, First of all, speaking about uh, uh, excitation emission spectra, uh, remember, uh, as Gabriele told you, to avoid, uh, if possible, um, spectral uh, overlap. In this case, uh, uh, there are two emission spectra, uh, one of uh, Alexa 488 and one for Alexa 546, and as you can see, there is a huge area of overlapping of the two spectra. If it is possible, you can decide to use uh, another floor form associated to the Alexa 488, just to be sure to have uh, almost no overlapping between the two emission spectra. But there is another situation in which uh, you have to be careful, and it is you have to check if the, laser, uh, the lasers you want to use are able to excite just one floor form at a time, one of the floor form that you have, of course, in, in your sample. So suppose uh, you have uh, DAPI and Alexa 488 in, uh, in your sample. You have to check if the 405 laser, that is the laser that you use for, excite, uh, for exciting DAPI, is able or not to excite uh, Alexa 488 also. This is the excitation spectrum or, uh, of Alexa 488. And as you can see, this is not the case. It is 2.5%. Uh, of efficiency, but it is really negligible, so it doesn't matter. Okay, you can use this couple of fluorophore, but suppose you want to use another couple of fluorophore, uh, DAPI again, and another <coughs> green emitting fluorophore. Someone could say, okay, it's the same, EGFP, Alexa 488, it's the same. I, why, why I have to check something? Okay. And here I superimpose the uh, excitation spectra of uh, Alexa 488 and uh, of EGFP here in blue. And as you can see, the 405 laser is able, in this case, to excite uh, EGFP, okay? Uh, with not a fantastic efficiency, but uh, around 20%. So using the combination of DAPI or in another more dramatic situation, for example, uh, a secondary antibody conjugated with Alexa 405, and this is really dramatic because you know that DAPI is staining just the nuclei, but if you are looking for an antigen using a floor for using Alexa 405, uh, you can really reach some totally wrong conclusion, okay? So this is just to say be careful every time you change 
the floor for, even if you are just substituting a green one with another one, because they are not the same, because the excitation emission spectra are not the same, even if they are green emitting, okay? Okay, and now let's move to the quantum yield or the quantum yield or quantum efficiency. It is just a quantitative measure of fluorescence emission efficiency. Um, corresponds to the number of photons emitted per photon absorbed, typically ranges between 0.05 to 1. It is strongly environment dependent and it is proportional to lifetime. I mean, um, fluorophore with a good quantum efficiency uh, will have also a um, longer lifetime. And now I would like to show you this table. And in this table, you can compare the quantum efficiency, uh, mm, in some cases also the, the lifetime. I wasn't able to find the lifetime for this uh, floor, for I'm sorry. Um, and you can compare one, uh, every, every one of these floor, for, and you can see that uh, there, are, uh, uh, there is a huge difference in terms of, of efficiency, for example, between Alexa 48 and, I don't know, Alexa 555, look. Or, um, I don't know, Alexa 647. So, if you want uh, to, um, if you want to be sure you are using um, the best fluorophore you can buy because you're working with uh, a very critical antigen, you have to check also this list, okay? Because you will have a better result using uh, a fluorophore with the higher uh, quantum efficiency. And I would like to um, catch your attention on this fluorophore here, the Alexa 633. The Alexa 633, is, it, it is one of the best seller fluorophore of life technologies, but the quantum efficiency and the lifetime are not detectable. So the question is, why researchers buy this floor for? Someone has a suggestion? They <laughs> don't know which laser they use. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> this is the answer because a lot of uh, uh, micros confocal microscopes are um, dotated of uh, a set of lasers and one of these lasers is the line 63. So people say, okay, I can buy the best fluorophore to obtain the best results using the 63 laser. The problem is that uh, these people doesn't know that uh, this fluorophore has a not detectable quantum yield. So it is really awful. So it, it, I think it is, there is no reason to use it. What you can do, for example, is uh, uh, to use Alexa Fluor 647. The quantum mill is not very high, but it is reasonable and it is detectable. Okay. And you can check, ah, this, um, just, just a parenthesis, the, all these diagrams are taken from the chroma uh, website. If you want to check the characteristics of the fluorophore, please visit this site because it is very nice and uh, well done. Um, okay, here you have the two uh, excitation curves of Alexa 63, and as you can see, it fits perfectly with the 63 laser line. Okay, and this is the curve of Alexa 647. Okay, it, it does not fit perfectly, but you can excite it around 50%. Uh, that it is absolutely reasonable. Okay. So, just few words about uh, quenching. Quenching is just uh, a, an irreversible decomposition of, uh, of the fluorophore due to interaction with uh, oxygen or with aliphatic or aromatic amines. Uh, in a very simple <coughs> way, I would like to show you this cartoon. Suppose this is your fluorophore. Uh, it receives light, it goes to an excited state, and, and here you can have, the, the fluorophore has two choices. Uh, it can uh, go back to the um, ground state emitting light, 
or it can transfer this energy to a quencher, but in this case, uh, of course, uh, no fluorescence happens, okay? This is in, in a very um, schematic way what, what happens, and this is the reason why you need to use a, an anti-fading, for example, as DABCO, in your mounting media, or you have to buy a mounting media uh, containing an anti-fading agent. Okay, on the contrary, photo bleaching is a, um, the photo resistance is a specific characteristic of every fluorophore because uh, the photo bleaching occurs when uh, a fluorophore permanently loses the ability to emit light. And this is due to photon induced chemical damage and covalent modification. Of course, we have to use photon because we have to excite our fluorophore. So sooner or later, we will photo bleach our fluorophore. And this is the bad news. The good news is that uh, some fluorophore bleach really quickly after emitting only few photons, while others that are more robust can undergo thousands or millions mm -hmm. of cycles before bleaching. And this is another characteristic that you have to know when you want to buy a new floor for, or when you want to check the characteristic of your old floor for that you already have in your fridge, okay? Okay, this is just an example, the same <coughs> the same cell and the same type of cells, the same type of uh, um, illumination, same cycle, cycles of illumination, uh, the couple Alexa 488, Alexa 546, uh, and the couple fluorescent side 3. As you can see, the difference is uh, dramatic. What I would like to show you is this diagram. Uh, it is really difficult uh, to find some uh, information that uh, uh, compare the characteristics of the different floor for, um, from the different companies. Um, in this case, uh, uh, the same sample um, uh, undergo the same protocol with the same continuous illumination, and you can compare seven different dyes. Okay? As you can see, uh, all of these dyes are green emitting dyes. You can use the same filter cube for every one of these uh, of these dyes. You can use the same laser, so you can use the same, let's say, setup. But as you can see, the the, the photo resistance is really, really different. You have these two fluorophore uh, Alexa 488 and MFP 488 that are more robust and even after 20 seconds are able to emit some light. And you have these two fluorophore, Promofluor and Chromio 488, that after five seconds are uh, totally um, burned. Okay? So when you um, want to buy a new fluorophore, uh, please ask also for this information. Not only the excitation emission curves, not only the quantum efficiency, but also the photoresistance. Okay? Okay, so method to counter photo bleaching. Uh, they are almost obvious, but okay, we can just read this slide. Uh, scan for a shorter time. Use, uh, whenever possible, superior quality optical components and state-of-the-art detectors. Reduce, whenever possible, excitation intensity. Use anti-fade reagents and use fluor for more robust. Okay. So I hope uh, uh, to have convinced you that not all fluorophores are the same. Pay attention. Remember they take different quantum yield. Remember that human eyes are more sensitive to green. So if you want to impress your audience, use the green one. Remember that autofluorescence is weaker at higher wavelengths. Uh, if you have to do a multiple staining, remember to use the best fluorophore for the most critical antigen, okay? Do not choose, oh, I like green, but maybe blue is nice. No, okay? Use the, the most um, uh, performing fluorophore for your uh, critical antigen. And be careful with spectra overlap, emission and excitation uh, spectra when you are performing multiple staining. 
and of course collect as much uh, uh, info as possible before starting your immunostaining. Okay, um, I do not have a lot of time. I would like just to show you a few um, last picture. I would like to uh, give you this information because uh, I was in trouble when, when I faced this, uh, this problem. Uh, remember that uh, DAPI is able to photoconvert, so there could be a photoconversion of DAPI. Not when you excite uh, the DAPI with the 405 laser, but uh, 30 seconds of UV, of an excitation with UV light, or more than 30 seconds, can convert uh, this molecule, and then you can see uh, the exactly the same staining also in the green channel, okay? Um, mountain, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the, um, you have to preserve your sample. It has to match the refractive index uh, of uh, the oil you plan to use with your uh, objective, immersion objective, and uh, uh, it has to contain scavengers uh, for uh, oxygen. Uh, just a few words uh, on the cover slip and then we can stop. Uh, cover slip. Use the right cover slip. Please, please use the right cover slip. <laughs> it is not so difficult. <laughs> okay, on every objective you have an inscription like this one. Look, this one or that one. And this inscription corresponds to the cover glass thickness that the company. Um, suggest you to avoid especially um, spherical aberration, okay? So, please buy cover slips of this dimension, okay, 0 0.17 millimeter, and if you, uh, some um, company uh, does not uh, uh, specify the thickness, but the number of the cover slip is not one, it is 1.5, okay, just for, for your information. Uh, okay, I, I think I can stop here, otherwise, yes, yes, okay, thank you. <laughs>